Hi everyone. So in this video, we introduce the uh, the topic of parameter initialization. So basically, how to start? What are the initial points? What's the initial setting of the weight and bias parameters? And that defines an initial point in the parameter space from uh, from which your optimization strategy uh, should start. So one thing um, to notice is that um, <clears throat> there are two viewpoints to uh, to basically parameter initialization. One is there is a criteria that's um, <clears throat> governed by the optimization uh, objective, which is basically to uh, uh, navigate the parameter space smoothly until you reach a good point. And another is the viewpoint of generalization, which is basically you want to generalize this solution you wanted to apply even to data uh, that were not seen during training, right? And these are usually different viewpoints, and in many cases, uh, they put tension on the choice of the, of the initialization strategy. So for example, let's say I have an external method that gives me an approximation of the function that fit the, the, the training data. And then I use the solution obtained by that external method and I initialize the weights to give me uh, that, uh, to, to basically uh, whatever solution is obtained through the external method. This could be beneficial from the uh, perspective of optimization because that can guarantee that I will be in a neighborhood of a, of a good solution or a locally optimal solution uh, with respect to the training data, right? But that, this may not be a good solution from a viewpoint of generalization because I'm using the training data so much to set the, the initial point, right? So I am depriving myself from the chance of exploring the parameter space and seeing if there are other points in the parameter space that may even uh, provide solutions that generalize better to uh, data that were never seen during training. So for example, from the viewpoint of generalization, it's good to find uh, an optimal solution in a flat region, and that's better than an optimal solution in a, in a region with a curve, with a steep curve, right? So, uh, so different solutions that may even have the same value uh, can uh, can have different uh, uh, can one of them can be preferred preferable to the other from the viewpoint of generalization right because this one here is more robust to noise than this one here as an example right so it's good to keep in mind these two viewpoints as governing the choice of the uh, of the initial parameter set in general, or a common practice, initial parameters are chosen to, pr to break symmetry between the different units, right? What does it mean, break symmetry? For example, a random setting of the, let's ignore the bias effect, a random setting of the weight parameters will break symmetry between the different units, right? In more, uh, in more rigorous notation, you break symmetry when you have linearly independent directions uh, uh, contributing to the different units, right? So you don't want, so let's think of one uh, a hidden unit, right? As a linear combination of the weights, uh, a linear combination whose coefficients are defined by the weights, right? And let's say this is node x1, this is node x2, this is node x3, this is node x4, right? Then node y here equal w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 plus w4 x4. This is a direction in the four-dimensional parameter space that is defined by x1, x2, x3, and x4, right? Another, Let's say this is y1, right? Another unit y2 will have other weights, right? You want the direction corresponding to y2 to be linearly independent from the direction corresponding to y1. Why do we want this? Because other than that, it's as if, if they are linearly dependent, then both y1 and y2 are exploring a one-dimensional space, right? So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 a space that has less than four dimensions because the uh, four is the rank, four rank of the space. 
right? So if they are linearly dependent, that means that they are spanning a space that has dimension less than four. So there is at least one dimension in the null space, right? So what does it mean, the null space? This direction is not spanned by y1 and y2, right? Is not explored by y1 and y2. And when I measure the sensitivity of the cost function with respect to the parameters and apply the parameter update, I have no way of exploring that dimension that is zero, right? That dimension that is not, um, that is not explored at all, right? So, uh, so this could be, this could be, uh, problematic. So you want, the initial parameters to allow exploration of all dimensions, right? To allow exploration of as much of the parameter space as possible. And because of that, you really want, this is the, this is the intuition behind the random initialization of weights, right? So, so usually the uh, weights are initialized to random values and the biases are initialized to heuristically chosen constants, right? And what's the wisdom behind the heuristically chosen constants of the biases? Is basically, you want the bias to activate, you want the bias to activate all um, all the nonlinear activation functions initially, right? So for example, if you have ReLU, then you add a small positive value as uh, as a bias. Why do you do that? Because you want all the ReLU units initially to be active. And when they are initially active, then you give a chance for each uh, of them to learn, right? Because if it's initially inactive, this is like depriving the network from the chance to explore the potential of using or exploiting that ReLU unit, right? So the biases, are chosen to be heuristic, uh, are usually chosen to be constants that enable all the nonlinear activations at the start and the weights are chosen to be random value, uh, values so that you have this linear independence between the different directions corresponding to different units, right? So that you break the symmetry between the different units. Now, the weights are typically chosen random from a distribution. The scale of that distribution matters. So, for example, if I have a uniform distribution, it matters whether it's from minus 1 to 1 or from minus 2 to 2 or from minus 100 to 100. If I have a Gaussian distribution, the same thing, <coughs> it matters what the variance is, how much I can, uh, like what are the range of valid values that are likely uh, to happen when I draw a realization from that distribution. In general, larger scales for the random weight initialization distribution correspond to stronger priors. It means it reflects a stronger belief about how the, uh, how the function would look like, how the, how the final solution would look like, right? So whenever we have stronger priors or encoding a stronger prior belief, we have to be careful, right? This could be very advantageous in terms of uh, uh, speeding the optimization process, but it could uh, it could be problematic uh, uh, if that prior is incorrect, right? And having stronger priors could also be advantageous from the viewpoint of generalization. If that prior would allow me to generalize better the data that I haven't seen, for example, by encoding certain rules, that apply uh, to the to the problem at hand. Uh, the last comment that I want uh, to say in this video is basically, this is a very open topic, and um, and all the insights that we have, uh, like that that I discussed in this video and in the coming two videos, are really uh, principled heuristics. But uh, but this is really an open research problem. How to uh, like uh, how much does weight initialization govern the final solution, and what are the uh, what are the optimal choices for weight initialization for every uh, optimization strategy and data generating process? Thank you.